Thank you. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, for those of you that are at home, this is a very upscale, uh, high class event. And so I'm really sorry you're not experiencing that because it really is, it's a lot of fun. It's what you would think a gallery opening would be if cool people went to gallery openings, right? <laughs> so, it's, so it's just a lot of fun. I enjoy these gallery openings an awful lot. And every time they start the email cycle with me and say, here's our featured artist and go, go visit the portfolio. Just amazing work. And, uh, in, 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 no, I can, I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> Just incredible work. And so I was very excited to, uh, to be able to host this with Remy Kazemi. Um, I want to read you a little bit if you're not familiar with him. And then I also want to invite our uh, viewers at home to open up two browser windows so that you can actually go over and see some of the work that we've been experiencing on these beautiful big prints here in the gallery. So let me go through just a brief introduction here. Uh, Rami started photography as a hobby. He holds a degree in, from the Recording Arts Canada and has a background in music and audio, but he realized that that particular career path wasn't for him. He decided he wanted to please the crowd. After picking up his first camera, he fell in love with photography, especially photographing outdoors. He enjoys the journey through his lenses and loves to explore the backcountry of planet Earth by photographing places that have been rarely seen by the human eye. And we'll get into a little bit here tonight about why that is. His passions for adventure in the wilderness and pristine landscapes is the driving factor behind his photography. Please welcome our featured artist this evening, Ramton Kazemi. So make sure that you see the spelling of this. It's just ramtonkazemi.com is a good place to go and start. He has another website that is adventurephotocanada.com. So either of those will give you a good feel for the type of work that we're going to be talking about and seeing on the slideshow behind us as we get into this evening. Rami, congratulations. Welcome. Thank you. All right, so I want to get into this just a little bit um, and let you know that uh, the folks at home will be able to ask questions as well. I'm going to ask some questions and we'll get started with uh, the beginnings of an interview. But if you're at home watching and you're thinking of uh, questions that you'd like to ask, make sure that you message those along with the live stream and in the control booth then they'll uh, send them here to me. Um, Rami, you have some really amazing, uh, one of the things that I noticed is the, the wide angle and the low aspect uh, of a lot of your images. Yep. And you have some just gorgeous landscapes on your personal and your business site. I'm curious, do you have any other genres that you shoot but you don't post? No. No, I mean, just this is it. No. That's it. This You've never taken pictures of a frog or people or... Um, no, I rarely take my camera out. I only take it out when I'm out there. Okay. And try and take... I, I started about five years ago. Um, needed some money, so I started doing weddings. Okay. They're so... How'd you get started? Well, it was about five years ago or so. Um, when I picked up the first camera, I had a friend of mine. Um, told me about this thing that's called DSLR. I had no idea, like literally six years ago, not even. Um, and I was always an outdoors guy. I mean, I always enjoyed the outdoors and being in the, in the wild and camping, and that was my life. Um, then when I just realized, you know, I, I can capture it all, and hang it on my wall, and wake up in the morning, look at a picture, that was just something else, right? So, um, yeah, I did weddings. I did one or two weddings, I think, and I realized that I couldn't deal with uh, with people. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I mean, I, I would look at my pictures the first couple of years and be like, how am I even going to compete? So what was your career? What What is it that you were doing? Well, I studied audio engineering, so I got right. into the audio and video mm -hmm. side of things. So I was basically um, doing automation, audio and video, conferencing, all that stuff, just setting up in the commercial world, right? So that's basically um, 
how I started it. Um, and I still have to do that part time in order to keep things going. Okay. So, but uh, hoping to soon, soon, very soon, jump over to full time well, photography. You're world famous now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is this is the tipping point, and from here forward. Um, you won't even remember who we are. You're just going to be so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually have a, a question already from online from Chris Wiley. And Chris Wiley asks, Rami, what is your favorite lens? And we're already geeking out on tech. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite lens? And at what focal length do you use it? My favorite lens is anything that um, that's wide, ultra wide. So 14 maximum 15 millimeters um, on full frame. So, and, the re and if you can see all my work is 99% sure. ultra wide. Um, and my f lens that I shoot with right now is a Tamron 15 to 30, 2.8, and I need that 2.8 in order to capture the night sky. Um, and that's really the only lens that I keep with me unless uh, there's something else. I have the 28 to 300, which is a super zoom, and that's good enough for me. It doesn't need do you, to be do, perfect. Do you do any zooms? I, I, yeah, there was one shot, if you saw. One shot in yeah. the gallery? So uh, there are times when I'm you know, in a location where uh, the sky is beautiful and I see mountains around me, but where I am at that moment, I just can't take a photo because there's nothing in the foreground, so I just, that's when I take the, uh, the 300 millimeter out. Um, but otherwise, it's mostly ultra wide. And I, I need okay, to so do I wanna, that. I want to ask you about this because you're stepping into, you're saying five years ago you learned the term DSLR. Yeah. And you're stepping into photography. You have an amazing eye for composing a scene. And there are a lot of things that a lot of us that have been taking pictures for years see these images and, and, and we say, not only do we want to be there, but we want to see things the way you see them, from the perspective that you see them. How did you learn that part of what you do? Well, that, believe it or not, was the hardest part. Um, yes, I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, I started studying uh, painters. Okay, and understanding composition and okay. image. Uh, because what you're doing is you're taking a three-dimensional world and you're transforming it into 2D, two-dimensional file. Sure. And all of a sudden you're losing depth and you have, now you have to understand what creates depth. All the compositional elements, you have to understand all that. And that really is what you need to understand when it comes to composition. Study painters, see what they do. Um, the lines, the patterns, the transitions, and in post, especially after that, you need to understand how to create these transitions and depth into your image because you know it's whatever that's further in the in the background, for example, is going to be soft, and whatever closer to you is going to be sharper, and then there's going to be um, you know transitions from warm to cool, from big to small. All that stuff is really important. So once you don't understand composition, and you see how a painter starts a scene, for example, when I've had some of the painters come into my um, workshops, actually, because they just literally wanted to take pictures so, I could, so they could paint it. Interesting. And, yeah. And because, obviously, the Yukon, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing. It's yes. beautiful. But uh, so I started studying painters and seeing that how they, how they basically compose their, their paint, paintings. And you know, when they see a landscape, they're not going to literally draw everything they see. They're going to exclude things, and obviously it's a lot easier for a painter because he's starting from scratch, and he has the canvas, and he can do whatever he wants, but as photographers, it's a lot harder because you only deal with what you get, and you have to get down low, change your angle until you exclude or include things to make sure that your final composition is a good one. So. That's really what you got to understand is the composition. It's a, it's a different spin on what is art and what is artistic. And you say it's a whole lot easier for painters. And as somebody who in high school, college, I w was trying hard to hone my painting skill. Yeah. And I thought, well, photographers have it easy. They just click the shutter. See, and, that's, yeah, yeah. that's the thing. You see, if you have the skills to paint, this, all you need when to become a painter is you need to understand the brush strokes and how to paint. Sure. But the hardest part is to really understand what you're going to be painting. Because if you can paint, but you don't know the composition, at the end of the day, it's not going to be as impressive. So you, that's the main thing, like, as I always say, is the composition is everything in a photograph. So in studying these artists to learn composition, 
did you have like a plan or was it just looking at classic art? How did you approach it? Just looking at my favorite landscape photographs. Um, my favorite, which is Mark Adamus, he is unbelievable. And when I looked at his shots, I'm like, well, that's what I really want to do. So I started studying, okay, what does he do? He uses ultra wide all the time. He gets close to his subjects in the foreground. He uses all these leading lines. Um, rule of thirds, I threw it out the window the second day I heard it because I was tired of hearing it. Uh -huh. But, you know, uh, there is. He just broke everybody's heart right here, <laughs> right? <laughs> there are times you can use it. I don't want to say that it's not uh, useful, but uh, rule of thirds so is So it's of those like things. a guide of thirds, not a rule of thirds. Yeah, and... that's the thing. I don't want to call it a rule, it's just a tool that you use. Uh, and plus, rules are meant to be broken anyways. True, true. So, um, and you were talking about leading lines. We've been talking about foreground. This image is amazing. And I, I, I want to understand, how did you compose this? How did you uh, approach this? Um, I just saw that X, the cracks on the ice. And I believe it started with somebody skating over there. And then the cracks started to grow and grow. Um, but. Uh, I look for simple things, if you see, all my compositional elements are pretty simple. So the X and the lines coming from the sides, I just saw that very simple element in the foreground. And I try to exclude whatever I can. Easiest, well, the, it's so easy to include too much into your composition, and that's the first mistake everybody uh, makes, uh, especially with an ultra wide, because you're covering so much ground and um, it's so easy to just include way too much into your photograph. So I always say, look for simple things. Go close to your subjects and try to find the, the simple lines and then start adding things slowly. Very good. Right. I have, I have a few questions that have been coming in. And actually, I want to compliment our home audience. More questions this time just getting started into the uh, episode than we've ever had before. So this is great. Alan Shearer wants to know, what is your biggest fear other than not making enough money? <laughs> <laughs> um, biggest fear? I don't know. I don't know if I have... Uh, he is I, I, fearless. And as soon as we get into some of the stuff that he's doing, you'll understand. This gentleman is fearless. <laughs> and um, a, a little bit unstable. Uh, <laughs> the uh, next question is from Katrina Steele. She wants to know, what is the most remote location you've shot? That would be the Yukon. And this is part of why I was talking about your Fearless. We were talking a little bit before yeah. uh, the opening of the gallery, and th th the conditions that you have to put up with. So I'd like you to give a little bit of, pull back that curtain a little bit and tell people some of the stuff that you do, where you go, what you put up with, um, as far as capturing these images. It is wonderfully, the temperature here is great. No. <laughs> so talk a little bit about what you put up with to get the, some of these shots. Um. Standing in the water at minus 45 Celsius with waders. Yeah. So like you, you have a corner on this market. I'm not going after it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of these locations, well, the Yukon, going back to the question, sure. uh, the Yukon is the most remote area that I go to, and we have to access it by a helicopter because simply there are no roads. So helicopter. Yeah. So we take a helicopter. We go in, we get dropped off with our backpacks, and then from there we backpack because I did that hike. There's actually a way to get to this area with uh, doing To hike, hike in the Yukon. Yes, and I did it once, and I'm not ever gonna do it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's something. So what do you, what do you put up with? How, how, what, are the, what are these conditions like? What is a day or a week like? How long do you do these things? Um, usually my tours go from anywhere from four nights to five or six nights. How many people go? Uh, I try to keep it very easy. So seven, maybe seven or eight people max, okay. typically, because I want my guys to actually learn. So when there's too many tripods around, too many people around, it's hard to learn. So I want to really make it, it's, it's a great experience because we, we have a lot of fun. Sure. Know? We have a lot of fun and we try to actually come up with 
photogra photographs like this. So I really try to teach them and really learn everything from start to finish. And uh, not only that, after that, I showed them how to post process as well. So, with, with respect to these conditions, how many people have died? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever. Okay, well, let, but let's talk about it. How does, a, how does a, a workshop with you work? I mean, are you like living at the Hilton and then you step out, snap a shutter and step back in? That's the thing. There are different workshops. So the Canadian Rockies, for example, is for anyone. If you can walk on ice and water, uh, on, on, and snow, if you can walk on ice, did you catch that? If you can walk on ice and water, if you can walk on water, <clears throat> that was great. <laughs> she just said that. If you, can, if you can walk a little bit for, for you know, half an hour on, on snow and ice, you should be fine because we stay in hotels. Okay. And we get out, we drive to these locations, a heated car, you know, you got your hotels, you got your food, everything's good. The only place that right now I do that is really adventurous, camping type, is the Yukon. Okay. So, so that how, one is, how many days? We're talking about five nights being in there with the backpack and a tent. Um, it could go anywhere from zero to minus 10 at night. Uh, with a good sleeping bag, you're fine. And <laughs> those... <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's... Well, for the Rockies, it's, it's actually pretty easy. Okay. A lot of people come there in the in the winter because it's beautiful out there, and um, a lot of a lot of people go there to ski and to visit the area, and we just uh, stay relaxed and wake up a little bit early for the sunrises. Of course, I mean, if you're coming on these tours, you want to catch the sunrises. You don't want to miss them. But um, the good the good thing about Rockies at that time of year is the sun comes up and three, four hours, you got the golden hour. Oh, and, that's great. And even at two in the afternoon, that sun never is up in the sky. It's low. It stays very low. So anytime, there could be beautiful photographs taken. Very good. Yeah. We have some other wonderful questions rolling in. Uh, Leslie Breeze, Natalie, is there a shot that you, uh, that you compelled to get? Is there a shot that you must be you are compelled to get. What shot has surprised you the most, good or bad? So is there some sort of shot that you really are drawn to? Typically, it has to have a mountain in it because uh, I've always loved mountains. And okay. there's something about, you know, I've got a tattoo of a mountain here, but it's, uh, it's something, I, I can't explain it. It's, uh, it's a feeling that I get every time I go near a mountain and I just camp out. So I typically just go towards the mountains and anywhere that's, that's got really nice uh, remote mountains areas. But uh, I'm trying to expand right now because uh, I want to do some more accessible, uh, easy to accessible locations now. So um, things are going to change. I think I'm going to do more and more of different areas because I need to expand. Okay. And I want to have different type of images as well. So I am working on that. Now, Leslie also had a second part to her question, which was, um, was there ever a shot that really surprised you? Which one surprised you the most? In other words, in a lot of these cases, with a lot of professional artists, professional photographers, you have a vision in your mind of what you'd like to capture. Yeah. But have you ever surprised yourself? Not really surprised. I mean, yeah, the only time that I was surprised was by the color of the Norton lights, how the camera captured it. Okay. Right? Because when I was looking at it, I, could, I mean, it was beautiful, don't get me wrong. Um, I could even see the glow through the tent. My friend woke me up at like midnight, yeah. right, not far from that area. Um, he's like, you, you, gotta, you gotta get up. I'm like, I just opened my eyes there, right there. Yeah. So I just opened my eyes and I'm like, I just could see a glow through the tent, yeah. like, literally. So, and I opened the zipper. I could see them dancing just all over the sky, right? So, but it, it, it is not quite like that. It's more like whitish green. So you don't see it with intense colors, but when the camera captures it, with an eight captures second, a different a different spectrum. Well, yeah, you can see the color with your eyes, but it's faint green. I see. But the camera captures it, it's like, holy, that's really, really okay. green. So it's, uh, that was really interesting. Um, one has come in from 
Chris Wiley, as of today, what is your favorite photo and why? And if it is one from the gallery tonight, what is the name of it? And by the way, would you get the mic just a little closer, closer. to you? And they, they can turn the volume down and we won't get the feedback. All right. So there you go. Good. So um, what is your, uh, as of today, what is your favorite photo and why? I don't think I can answer that. Don't have a favorite? No. They're all your babies. They are. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's like, yeah, you can't just select a photograph and say that is my favorite. Um, they're all very special in their own unique way, so it's really tough to answer that one. Okay, I'll let you off the hook on that. Uh, a good friend of mine, brilliant photographer, Ali Rajabi, um, what is the concept of your photographs? If somebody has your equipment, and be a professional one, they can make this picture too. So what makes your photos different from the others? It's my own eyes. I guess I see things differently. So your composition? Yes. I mean, um, that's, that's the thing. I, uh, I love teaching because I can teach everything I know, starting from composition, from lighting, from post-processing. I can teach you every technique that I know in post-processing. But at the end of the day, you or anybody else is not going to make images exactly like me. They're going to have their own vision. Sure. So it's just everybody's different, I guess. You know, I have, I have my own. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the things that you do teach. You teach, obviously, uh, how to capture the image. You teach post-processing. Yeah. Do you do anything in post-processing like compositing? This is actually a question from uh, James Dun uh, Dern, sorry, Dernford. Um, is there any of your work that is composited? And do you do bracketing? Um, bracketing I used to do when I shot with Canon, but I don't have to anymore with Nikon because it's got such a great dynamic range. Um, okay. I can get most of my shots with one, one single exposure, and if you can see, most of them are dark, and I like that dark shadows in the, in the, in the, uh, in the photos. So yeah, I rarely do bracketing if I have to, but... And you shoot raw? Of course. All raw. <laughs> uh, okay, it's not a stupid question. <laughs> So every, I, I was asking for, uh, Bill Smith asked if you shoot raw. It wasn't me. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a hard name to come by. Yeah, sorry about um, that. <laughs> so, yeah, and then the other part of the question was compositing. Right. Um, I call myself a landscape photographer still. Obviously, I do a lot of post-processing, as you can see, but I still call myself a landscape photographer. And, there's a line that I can't cross, okay? When I do compositing, it's gonna be perspective blending, uh, focal length blending, things like that, all from the same area. So I'll never do something, um, you, know, you know, shoot the foreground somewhere else and then put it in another image. Or, okay. Because my, you know, most of my clients, they want, they're like, take me here, they show me my photo on their phone, they're like, take me exactly to this location, so I have to be able to take them there. Sure. So. I still take photographs, but yes, I do perspective blending, a lot of that, and not the exposure blending again, uh, we don't need that anymore, but uh, yeah, focal length blending, because when you shoot ultra wide, some of those mountains in the center of the frame can look really, really tiny and small, so I gotta actually um, shoot another file with maybe 35 millimeter or 40 millimeters, and then okay. I blend the two together. So the foreground is shot wider. Interesting. So you shoot yeah. the foreground wider, and you get yeah. you still get the same overall image. Exactly. So that I bet that is uh, a big part of your process. Let's talk a little bit about your workflow. You have something in mind. You go to a place to capture an image, and then you, once you capture a raw image, then you take it back and, and work on it on your computer. And um, so let's, t take me through the process of image in your mind to finished image ready to print. I rarely have a project in my mind. Okay. Um, there are times that I have something specific in my mind. I'm like, yeah, I wanted it to be a night shot with the Milky Way, with a canoe, for example, in the foreground. But most of the time when I'm exploring, it's just 
it ends up being something different. I mean, maybe I don't think about it at all. It's just, it just comes at that moment. Depends on the light, depends on the, on the moment. It really is, at the end of the day, um, when I go home and I look at the images, sometimes I start the process of finding what I'm going to do with it when I get home. Interesting. Yeah. So what does that look like? How do you decide? What is your post-process process? My, my main concern when I'm shooting is to get a good composition with good lighting. As long as I know that I have an amazing composition with good lighting, then you can do anything you want in post-processing. Okay. Okay. Uh, and by good lighting, I don't mean colors. Uh, you don't have to necessarily have uh, uh, an amazing sunset. It's the quality of light. It's how it's hitting your subject. Not necessarily, oh, look how colorful that sunrise is. It's about how it's coming into your scene and how it's lighting up your subjects. So sometimes I'll, uh, for example, I'll wait for when I have a, a, a picture with, with the sun right in front and then I have the, I have the um, sun star and all that. So I have that idea. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have the sun in the image, but I'll wait for the sun to go behind the mountain, and then I take another shot for the foreground because I don't like that harsh light hitting my foreground elements, and then I blend that in because it's softer light. So but it's not bracketing, about, but it is exposure blending. It's, yeah, whatever you wanna call it. It's just, I, I think about different elements of the image. If I'm shooting the water, I'm like, and I don't have uh, my filter on, I'll just go F22, shoot the water, get that water, make sure it's good, and then I'll think of different elements, make sure everything else is in place, and then I know I have everything I need in order to blend later in Photoshop. Okay. When you do that, are you, are you capturing multiple images from the same exact yes, tripod yes, position? Yes, yes. Sometimes I said perspective blending, sometimes yeah. I move the tripod just okay. to be able to get a different perspective, but it's gonna be literally within that same area just moving the camera ever so slightly up and down can make a huge difference. Um, sure. And sometimes I'm able to get, for example, the mountain and everything I want in the background, but because of my foreground, I need to be here, for example, then I'm gonna lose the background, so I sometimes yeah, I do move see, a little and, bit. And that is something that is really breathtaking and, and striking about your images. You, a, a, as an observer of the images, I'm thinking, this is gorgeous, I know it's real, how is it captured? And, and this is helping to, yeah. to understand that you're doing this perspective blending. Yeah. Because I, I see wide angle, and I'm like, but my wide angle doesn't ever give me that. Yeah. So you're cheating. And, and <laughs> no, no, I'm just teasing him. He's not. <laughs> but but you, have a, you have an eye, and you have the ability to pull these elements of a scene together that you've captured with different perspectives? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, uh, I, like I said, I just think about it as the final, like I, I just think about different elements, right? And sometimes you just can't get everything in one shot. You yeah. just cannot. How did you learn to do this? To be honest with you, we go back to that same first question, I believe, which was, um, understanding composition, yeah. so studying my favorite artists, okay? So um, when you start to understand what makes a good image and a good composition, which is something that I can't really get deep into detail right now, um, then everything becomes so easy. Learning how to do something is not the hard part, it's learning what you want to do. You have to understand what you want to learn and what you want to do. Once you find out what you want to do with the image, learning how to do it is the easiest thing. The hardest part is finding what you're going to be doing. Okay. Right? Let's talk a little bit about your, your workshops. Yeah. How do these come together? Do you pick a place that you say, I want to go there, that's going to be great, and then open it up on your website and let people sign up to come? Well, the first part of the, any workshop or tour is that I have to go there first myself to get the images okay. and explore. Explore until I have the images, until I know the place, because I'm not just uh, an instructor, I'm also a guide, so I need to know where I'm going, I need to know how I'm getting to places. So that's the first part. And then the image is really what sells the workshop, right? Uh, okay. Because they want to know, 
they want to basically get the images that I get. So I take them out there, I show them exactly how I do it from start to finish. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. so you go out, capture images. Yeah. That's how you build a workshop. Yep, exactly. That really is it. And you, I, you do need those initial images. How are you marketing your workshops these days? Marketing? I'm not really good at marketing, to be honest with you. But, but you I get try. people to the go to your workshop. It's my website. That's the only thing. Yeah? A little bit of social media, but it's mostly my website and the images. Really the only thing that's selling it right now. Right. Now, are you posting your images on Instagram? Are you posting Instagram. I have okay. an Instagram account, and yeah. I have Facebook, um, and then I have the website. But yeah, so but I, I really suck at marketing. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this: that. Do your do your um, workshops sell out? Uh, they are selling out, but I do announce them. I like suck it takes at a long time. They're selling out. Well, well, here's the thing: they're selling out, but it takes me a long time to sell them. Sell them right now because I announced them a year in advance. I see. Right. So, but I need to get to that point where I can just. You should win a gallery or something. And I should. Yeah. I should. That'd that would be a great, great idea. Yeah, would yeah. be great that'd for be it. That'd be a great idea. Okay, so let's let's step back a little bit and talk about um, some of the the nerd stuff. My, I come at photography from a gear angle, so I'm always interested in sure. what gear are you shooting, yeah. and and I want to talk a little bit about that. So we've talked about composition, your artistic background, yeah. and seeing images from an artistic perspective. Yes. And then somebody told you about this DSLR thing. Yeah. So what has your journey through the gear been like? At the beginning, it was all about the gear, you know, I, because like I said, I was looking at the images going, well, my favorite landscape photographers, and I was like, well, these look just mind-blowing. They're amazing. So I would go out and shoot and come back home, look at the images, be like, ugh. <laughs> what? How are we ever going to compete with these guys? I mean, this is just impossible, right? Um, so I'm like, no, there's got to be a way. I just have to study it more. And I really wanted to do it. That it really comes down to that, that I wanted to do it. OK. Anything in life. You want to do it, you'll do it, period. OK. Now, you're an outdoor person to begin with. Yeah. It, how, how does, before photography, what was your life like? What, how did outdoor stuff fit into your world? Well, since I, I was little. I always remember that every time we went to you know, a camping trip or, 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 or a picnic or anything, I was just the happiest. You know? As long as there was you know, trees and mountains and water around me, I was happy. Okay. It just made me happy. I don't know how to explain it. I remember as, since I was a little kid, I always loved being in the outdoors. And uh, it just never stopped. You know? and, and that's actually what's helping me right now with, uh, with landscape photography, especially going into these locations. Like, like I said, I enjoy doing what I do not necessarily the end result or the picture or the photograph. Yes, I am doing the photograph because it's just, you know, they're my trophies, but at the end of the day, I love getting up at four in the morning to go and watch the sunrise. If you don't, it's simply not gonna work because it can be demanding, you know? It can sure. be physically demanding sometimes. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes, you, you know, if you come out with me in the Rockies, you don't have to worry because everything's taken care of. But as a, as a, you know, as as a personal, like for me, for my personal trips, you know, I don't know anything. I'm going to explore, so anything could happen, right? So okay, so let's talk a little bit about the workshops then, because this is something that I hadn't considered deeply, and that is there are lots of photographers doing workshops yeah. all over the planet. Yeah, and you have some chilling conditions <laughs> yeah. that, that you're going to take people into. So what kind of preparation do you have for your clients? Well, um, it's mostly just informing them about you know, the temperatures and the, and the stuff that we're going to be dealing with. The most important thing is that you tell them you know, where we're going to be sleeping at night, what we're going to be doing each day, um, what the temperatures are going to be like, are they prepared, do, do they have already clothes, do they need to buy? So I, you know, as soon as they sign up, I'm in contact with them on the phone or email, and, and I help them out to get everything that they need. Uh, yes, there's got to be, I don't just sign, you can't just sign up on the spot. You obviously have to read the brochure so you know and you're informed. So on my website, on, on, on all of them, I have a brochure for each uh, workshop that tells you exactly what we're going to be dealing with. 
Okay. So before you purchase anything, you're going to know what's going on and what the temperatures are like. And if they're missing something, we can always rent stuff out. Um, there are outfitting companies. Um, some people, they just want to do it once. They don't want to buy the gear. So there's always help. Okay. So l let me find out a little bit about um, your day job as of five years ago and what your evolution into being more of this um, working toward the full-time photography deal. Yeah. Um, what did that path look like? Because there are a lot of people that consume Kelby programs like this. They tune into the grid. They, they take Kelby One classes. And they're enthusiasts about photography. And they see somebody like you who is a, a, an accomplished artist and living your dream in your photography. So bring some of our, our enthusiast photographers along with you. What has that process been like? Where did you start? What were some of your milestones? How, how are you accomplishing moving from a different type of career into photography? That actually was really tough and it's still really tough because again, um, your day job, that, that's what, what's still killing me right now because I still have to do it part time and I was able to finally do it in such a way where I can still get some time off. But um, you know, every vacation I had with doing that those five years was exploring. So I've never had a vacation where I just go on a beach and I just relax. I haven't done that in five years. Uh, so that's how uh, you have to really, you know, get these images. And the only time I could do it was on my vacation, which was by, you know, paid by the company. And uh, so every time I was just always just going out there, finding these locations, going at home and on Google Map and trying to find these locations. And that's what I use a lot actually for scouting areas uh, is Google. Uh, it's a fantastic tool. Okay, mm. so you're scouting locations on your free t your little bit of free time from yeah. your day job, yeah. and you're capturing images and working with your composition. Yeah. When did you flip the switch to accepting people to go along with you to doing paid workshops, that becoming was, that instructor? Yeah, that was just about uh, two and a half, three years ago, I think. Um, and right now, my workshops are happening probably maybe four or five times a year. And I'm really working hard on trying to get them fully, um, you know, just do them that full time. Yeah. And it's taking a bit of time, but uh, you know, every, you know, everything takes, takes time and it's sometimes times are tough, but it's, um, yeah, it's just all about exploring, really. I need more time to explore. And uh, right now I have a few locations in mind. So for the ones that are not so adventurous, uh, there's gonna be a lot more in the locations, uh, islands and warmer weather, all that stuff. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. Okay, all right. Yeah. I think I might be able to sign up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that I'm interested in in your process is I see that some of your prints are available for sale. Yeah. How much of your business is that part? Um, not a lot. Okay. It's mostly tours and workshops. Okay. I would say 90% is tours and workshops. Um, the prints are usually uh, mostly just, uh, sometimes I'll have someone that says, listen, I want that picture on my wall. And I do it sometimes locally in Toronto and I go and I check the wall, make sure you know the size and the color, and I like you know depending on the theme of the room and all that stuff. So we go, I go through the whole thing just to make sure that they get a nice print in the room okay. and all that. Um, but other than that, um, it's mostly the tours for business. With respect to those prints, you showed up here. What did you think when you saw these Bay Photo? Uh, exposure prints, uh, <laughs> all these big prints that you're used to seeing on your website. Yeah. And now you see them here. No, I was blown away. I was totally blown away. I couldn't believe the quality of, of, uh, of the prints. I mean, I've, I've printed before, um, but they have done an amazing job. Oh, this, yeah, we are actually seeing some of the shots from the gallery, uh, the gallery opening this evening. 
it, it is. And some of the details that I would not, I'm like, oh, look at those trees. I didn't even <laughs> see that in the shot before. And now it's printed. It's like all these details are coming out. For the record, he did not take the picture of the wine that we had. Uh, but, but this was a lot of fun. The gallery opening itself was a lot of fun. And it was nice of you to share your time with our attendees here. I think we all had a, had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Um, what, who would you say, since you talked about your inspiration being classic art and artists and composition, who are some of your inspirations? I would say the biggest one is Mark Adamus. Okay. He is just a phenomenal landscape photographer. I mean, um, you know, you can talk about Ansel Adams as much as you want, but <laughs> you can talk about Ansel Adams as much as you want, but you only had so much tools uh, back in the days, in the film days, to work with. So yes, his compositions are amazing, but today what you can do with images is, is just, you can't even compare it with those the film days. Um, so with all these tools, Photoshop and all this stuff that we have, it's just, I think, uh, yeah, Mark Adams, Ted Gore is a great one, American landscape photographer again. Um, but the biggest one was Mark. And I, I looked at his images, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get to that level. Not necessarily do his images and copy his style, but I need to learn those techniques. I need to see what he does, what lenses he uses, how does he get his thing? And then we talked about the gear earlier, so I was a little bit, you know, I'm like, I gotta have the best lens and 2.8 and the most expensive lens sure. and the camera. And I realized that you should be getting these results with an entry-level DSLR. Was he doing ex uh, the perspective blending that you do? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. I have learned uh, a lot from him. You won't find anything um, online uh, from this guy. He's a, pre he's a ghost, pretty much. So he doesn't <laughs> have a, and, you know, he has an Instagram, Instagram account, but if you search his name, you'll see what I mean. He has a website. His work is unbelievable. And he's been my biggest inspiration, so. All right, do you have interests outside of photography? Maybe things that influence your photography. You know, for me, the biggest thing is nature. Um, I, like, I like technology, I and mean, that's why I started doing the AV, but uh, I lost my passion very quickly. I mean, I just, I just, I can't. Do the people at your day job know that you don't yes. care anymore? Yes, <laughs> they do. They actually do. I actually told my boss recently, I'm like, uh, I am just doing this to get by. What was their reaction? <laughs> he was like, this, I mean, as long as you come to work, that's all I care about. <laughs> that's so, great, yeah. that's great. So, uh, in doing landscapes, I see a lot of very cold places, and you talked about warm places. Have you started scouting? I am just in the middle of checking this place out. I'm not, I can't tell where yet. Okay. But uh, I have, I've started checking them out, and um, it's, it's a place, it's a very interesting place. It's got uh, sand dunes, sea stacks, almost like the American Southwest looking like the landscape. So it's got a kind of a little bit of everything in it. So I'm re and I don't have, um, I haven't seen a lot of images from that area, which is what, which is what I want to do. Mostly go to places where it's not been photographed to death, like Iceland. And, right. Right. So that's where I usually try to go and try to just, you know, find new perspectives. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's coming. I can't tell you where yet, but it'll, it'll come up soon. All right. I want to read a quote from your website sure. uh, I found rather interesting uh, regarding technique and process. So the quote is, in order to produce images that are pleasing to the human eye, the artist must know imagery. We must understand the basics like composition, lighting, and color. These fundamentals are unavoidable. Settings, cameras, lenses, and tools come second. So you're not looking for a Nikon sponsorship? No. Okay. No. Uh, not at all. Nothing should matter until one understands how to add depth to a still image. I use lots of different techniques on my work. Exposure blending, perspective blending, or even blending different moments of time. 
I do what I can to make my photographs presentable and nothing will ever stop me and take my creative freedom away. You sound really committed. I am. I have to be because there's a lot of people out there. They're, you know, they're trying to tell you that you know you're you're not a photographer because you do this. It's, you know, you do too much Photoshop. And I'm like, you know what? It's my thing. Okay. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, I don't know why people is just they're just always judging. So I gotta have to kind of you know put put it out there. That was my artist statement, just to let people know what I do, and how I do it, and I'm gonna continue doing it the way I do it. Um, like I said, there's a line. It's going to be a landscape photograph. It's going to represent the reality. It's not going to be something crazy. I'm not going to add the Milky Way on top of every mountain where usually you don't see it. But, you know, I just wanted to put it out there so that people know. And, I, yeah, there's some post-processing out to be done to these images. You say you teach post-processing. Yeah. How do you teach post-processing? In other words, um, with your workshops, you have people out in ridiculous conditions and then then you come back to a hotel and teach them post-processing yes. there so if there's, <clears throat> there's if there's a hotel sure we'll do it there if okay. not I'll get back I'll record a tutorial and I'll send it to them okay do you do any instruction for people who are not at your workshops in other words do you have yes okay so yes. tell me a little bit about what you have um, I do one-on-one -on -one Skype sessions um, it's all on my website I do also private tours as well. So okay. if anybody comes along and just messages me on the, on, on, on the you know, uh, from my website and says, listen, I want to go to this place and I want you to take me there and show me how to photograph, I can do all that stuff as well. And, um, but the online Skype sessions is, is a popular one as well because a lot of people, uh, it's like, you know, whatever. Uh, I don't know how much I charge, but it's on my website. <laughs> basically, you, um, yeah, you basically go in and let me know when you want to do it. We'll go online together. We'll choose either one of your images. And if I don't feel that you have an image that we can work on, I'll pick one of mine and I'll show you from start to finish. And you can ask me questions while we are on it, on the, on the phone together. So yeah, it's, uh, it's another there. With respect to perspective blending. Yeah. That's multiple images. Yes. Right? So yes. how would you teach something like that? Well, I will have multiple images in my, in my, uh, in sure. my folder, so I'll just pick one. Do you, well, do you then teach people, you have to go out and do this and capture these different focal lengths? Yes. So exactly. So you're talking about these Skype sessions or are you talking about general? Yeah, I'm just talking about, well, obviously if you do a workshop, you're there, yeah. they're there with you, exactly. and you teach them, take these different perspectives. But when you're doing an online training, coaching <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Then I would just have to talk to them and just tell them, listen, yeah. um, if this is how I shot it, and this is why I shot it that way, I took multiple exposures. I took this one because I wanted to do focus stacking. Again, focus stacking is almost in all of my shots. Like, I mean, that's focus stacked. Um, I have no choice because I'm like, as you know, I'm always literally a few inches away from my foreground elements. So I always have to do focus stacking. That's that's goes without saying almost it's all my shots. Yeah. So yeah. How do you do your focus stacking? Do you do your process through Lightroom? Is everything Photoshop? Photoshop. Okay. Everything Photoshop. Yeah. So I, not Lightroom isn't part of your mix. Not really. I only use it to organize my files mm -hmm. and you know, take the um, certain things off, you know, like profiles, corrections and whatnot, uh, bringing up the shadows just to make it, you know. Just You're doing some things in Photoshop that, yeah. that are not common. Yeah. Um, how did you learn these unique approaches? Uh, again, this goes back to my, um, my inspirations. I uh, reached out to them, um, trying to get them to teach me got some of their tutorials uh, because the books out there, believe it or not, it, it's, it's I, I read a lot of books and online things. It's just, I have learned so much more by just watching one hour of tutorial from my favorite landscape photographer than I could, I, and I did reading many books. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, okay, so you mentioned at one point, you kind of skimmed past it, helicopter hikes. Tell me about that. A lot of fun. 
Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and they're yeah. they're free, right? There's helicopters out there. You just oh yeah. Go, you go out and yeah, ask. you just wait for the next one. Yeah. <laughs> So how do you arrange something like that? And how do you find out about it? And then how do you, you know, how do you find a helicopter pilot who's not crazy uh, <laughs> or just crazy enough to take you to those crazy places? Yeah. Well, that's uh, a big part of landscape photography is planning. Okay. So um, planning is really, really important. So if for me, I have to find out first how I'm going to get there, who's going to take me there, and all that stuff, like you said. So. I just research. I spent sometimes months, literally months, to just find out how I'm going to take one single shot. So I'll be doing research for a year in advance, so I start already researching where I'm going to have to go. Who's the local guy there? Maybe they can tell me a few things. Um, is there any charter flight you know, helicopter company out there? which I found, and then now they're just working with me, so I just, you know, I just use their services, their helicopter services. All that stuff is just all research. All research, and, okay. you, and, and, and it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time, surprisingly a lot of time, to research all that stuff out. And I guess this is what most people uh, pay me to take them, because they just don't want to spend the time in doing all this research, right? So that's, and, and planning, it's, it's the, I guess, the boring part for most people, but it's not boring for me. I love planning. So I love getting on, you know, Google map and trying to see what there is to shoot and finding where the sun's going to be coming up from. Do you have anybody that ever um, commissions you and says, I want to go there, and then you have to do the research about a place yes. that somebody else wants yes. to go? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Because they know that I can take them there and show them how to take the photographs. So even if I don't know the place, that would be mostly like a personal private tour. Sure. But yeah, I have had uh, people come up to me and say, you know, let's just go there. I've never been there, but I want to go there. <laughs> As a photographer, do you do any what I would call self-assignments? Do you do anything where you say, I want to create such and such, or I want to improve a certain aspect of my work? Oh, yeah. I mean. Like, where I am today is nowhere near where I want to be. I mean, this is just far from where I want to be. Where um, do you want to be? I just got to get better. This What's better? <laughs> this is really good. <laughs> it's so, never so, good enough, though. But, okay, that's really cool of you to say that. Uh, how, what, what is better? What, what kind of vision do you have? People are, like me, want to know You've, you've created some breathtaking photography, and it is, it is amazing to look around in the gallery, look on your website, look here behind us. How can you see beyond this? What do you see beyond this? Well, that's very nice of you to say, and um, you know, I try, but the thing is, at the end of the day, um, we are all always learning. So. For me, I still need to understand how to create more depth into my images. For example, okay. um, separating certain things in post-processing, and, and again, learning more about composition, making things even better. There's always better. You, you know, I mean, I'm looking at my favorite, you know, landscape photographers, and I'm like, yes, I could be better. But I mean, how? I mean, it's just. <laughs> is there is there a thing you go? Oh, yeah, that could be sharper or. What what is it? What is it? What yeah, is your there, definition there are of There's certain better? things that I see in my images. For example, in this one, you know, I'm like, you know, there could be more separation between that one and that one, that C stack, because that one's further away, and there's not enough separation between them. Oh yeah, I saw that. <laughs> but you don't. You see, you don't see that. I see that. Okay. And it makes a difference when you are looking at the photograph. You're not seeing that exact thing, but it is actually making a difference for you when you're looking at the final image. Okay. And color, um, also color balancing is very important. That's another thing that I do. Sure. Um, I shift the colors in the scene so that they match each other. Okay. Um, let's say um, somebody's playing a piano and playing a song, everything sounds great, and then you just start playing all over the place. Sounds bad, right? You don't want to listen to it. It's exactly the same thing with color. It's exactly the same thing. There are two colors in the scene that 
don't work well with each other. They need to be in harmony. So if there is a red and a green, I'll shift the red to a point where in the color wheel matches a harmony, a color harmony. Okay? Interesting. Yeah, so that is that goes to in every uh, one of my shots. So when I'm done post-processing, I'll, I'll go over the colors. First of all, see how many colors, colors I'm dealing with, and then see what harmony is going to work there. Because there are all these different types of color harmonies that are out there that sure. are known to work with each other. And artists know that, painters know that. And I just go in and shift the, the colors until they match. Which tools in Photoshop are you using for that process? Um, there is, um, I don't use a tool anymore, but uh, I used to use that thing called Adobe Color Themes. Okay, but, but what processes? Okay, so you can just ser uh, use Selective Color. Selective Color is the best tool okay. to change your and shift your colors. You can do amazing things without uh, ruining your colors. So Selective Color or just Hue, saturation sometimes is Hue is enough. You get to certain color, you pick that color, and you just change the hue just a little bit so that it matches the rest of the color in your scene. Um, so you're making consistent color families across yes, your entire exposure. Yes, so at the beginning I used to look at these color harmonies, right? So I would look at them and say, okay, there's this color harmony um, that I need to go by. So I would look at it literally and then see what colors there are and match it with that with the color harmony. But now I don't really use that anymore because I'm used to doing it. So. It's one of those things that once you start doing so much, then you know what color works with what. So I know in my head what to shift so that it matches the rest of the scene. But at the beginning, you might need that tool to understand, okay, what's, it's called Cooler, I think. Okay. But yeah, you can go online, Adobe has that. So I'm, I'm getting messages here that we do need to wrap it up. Yeah. So as we do this, would you tell our home audience how to find out more about you and your learning process and your workshops. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for tuning in, everybody. And uh, you can find me on RamtingKazimi.com or AdventurePhotoCanada.com. Um, everything was going to be there. You can contact me. I answer every email. Um, I'm very interactive with people that way. You can ask me any questions you want about any future workshops. Um, everything is online. Uh, my photograph, my portfolio, the trips, the information about everything is all online there. So, um, again, thanks for tuning in. Ladies and gentlemen, Rampton Kazimi.